Yeah, here we are, the Women Matters edition of March 2019. And after having talked twice about resilience, today we want to talk about resilience and emotional intelligence. Is it the same? How do they connect? Is it some similarities or is one needed for the other? So let's try out to to figure out what it is. But I think first, before we start, we could do a little bit of a check-in to let people know who we are today. Who wants to start? I'll start. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm Dorothy Sternkucha, and I live on the Oregon coast. And um, this is especially interesting to me because I raised a son and uh, it, a huge part of my awareness and commitment to him was to send him out of our home uh, with some emotional intelligence intact. And um, I did, and he's very resilient, and I'm very interested in the connection because I've never really thought of the two um, supporting each other in the way that I see it happening in him. Thank you. I can go next. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Luna Ciavelli and I live in Vancouver, Canada. And I work with systemic family constellations. And resilience is something that we talk about a lot in the work. And um, emotional intelligence as well. Um, how is that fostered? Uh, and how is resilience fostered? So I'm really curious to hear about your experiences and, and what, uh, what your thoughts are and to share in this discussion today. <laughs> Good. And I'm Tammy Lee Meyer. I'm also in Vancouver with Luna um, in a different physical space at the moment. Um, and I, I'm really curious about, about how our conversation will unfold today. And like um, both of you, as you've, uh, as you've kind of mentioned, it's interesting to look at how they're entangled. Um, because when I, when I think about the topic, it's like, yes, I mean, our resilience is, is based on how our capacities for emotional intelligence to some, to a large degree, at least for me. Um, so I, yeah, in, in thinking of my own experience, when I'm, I, I'm not in a space where I feel emotionally supported. It's really difficult to be resilient because, yeah. um, you know, taking things personally or making assumptions or these sorts of things happen, which definitely takes out my resilience. So I'm excited to share our, our ideas, uh, knowledge, wisdom, and questions today. Yeah, thank you. And I'm Heidi and I'm living in Italy where spring has come, as you can see behind me. Uh, it's very beautiful. And as an Enya type four, which is uh, considered the most emotional type of the Enneagram, uh, I'm very much interested in, in resilience and emotional intelligence. And um, I, let's, let's start uh, immediately like this. As uh, Enya type four, there has two parts. One is the trauma queen, or actually three parts, but the most distinguished uh, ways of expressing this Enya type is the trauma queen, which is complaining and lamenting and, you know, all these things. And there's the counterpart, who is not um, expressing emotions at all. Also, um, they are. And that's exactly my case. Uh, I thought I don't have emotions and my family, they said uh, I'm so emotional, but I was not in contact with emotions. And so when we talk about emotional intelligence, definitely that wouldn't mean to suppress emotions as I have learned as a, as a child. So I wonder what, what you understand um, under emotional intelligence, what is it? Hmm. Uh, Luna, I'm Heidi. I'm going to respond, but I was curious about 
your work, Luna. I don't know what it means that you do systems. What, what is it that you called it? Systemic family constellation work. And it's, uh, it, it comes originally from an indigenous model of healing from the Zulu people in Africa, um, <clears throat> where they would throw the bones and actually make constellation, meaning a map of the, uh, the people, the members, either of a family or a tribe, and would able to be able to see with the map uh, where the discordance was in, in the system. And through acknowledging what is first, then we can start to move to a better um, feeling configuration. And so it's, the work is done somatically. It's either done one-on-one -on -one or in a group. Um, and it's, uh, it's very beautiful, deep work where we get to really see what, what is. Luna, when you say that it's done somatically, maybe you could go a little deeper mm -hmm. into what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so of the body. Uh, so we're really listening to the body's wisdom with the work and we essentially kind of get to skip the middleman being our minds, which always want to get involved and solve the problem. And that's often the barrier to really seeing uh, where the conflict is uh, at a root level um, when we're having interpersonal issues. So we just ask the body to report um, what it's experiencing and we go from there. Thank you. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, the I, I I looked today, uh, or I looked today, yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> at a kind of a definition for um, emotional intelligence. I have all the little pieces, the fragments of it in inside me, but um, it seems like what I learned is that it's a pretty rational, <laughs> although it's called emotional intelligence. It's uh, really different than what you're saying, Heidi, um, Luna, about, you know, the focus that you have. Um, the, the four major parts of it from a New York Times article was that emotional intelligence involves self-awareness, being realistic about who you are and having emotional insight into that, uh, an ability to self-manage, where the resilience is the big part of that, where you can self-calm and, and recover. And then there's empathy, where you feel a cognitive recognition that ignites your empathy, as well as an emotional empathy, an ability to listen, uh, an ability to um, acknowledge uh, what is going on in the other person, what they are needing. And then the last one is relationship skills. Um, which is really about being able to communicate, being able to listen, um, being able to see yourself as part of the team rather than the boss. <clears throat> and that seemed like a pretty all-American, concrete, uh, not somatic <laughs> approach um, to resilience and to um, uh, how emotional intelligence and resilience, how having these skills, these self-awarenesses, these commitments can indeed um, promote uh, a resilience uh, because as you were saying, if you don't feel these supports, then all of a sudden our ability to be resilient is really very compromised. As you were sharing, I was also, Dorothy, thank you for that. I really appreciate bringing in, you know, the, the, the definitions as they're defined in more traditionally. Um, and I was in, in the last few weeks, I've been helping uh, one of our colleagues, Gertraud Vext, to uh, do a translation on her work. Um, through a group of, of people called the appreciators. And so they are, um, they collectively are um, working with organizations, individuals, um, and businesses to, to really uh, institute appreciative principles in their work. And she has something that she calls the, the streetlight model, which is, it, it, it really quite uh, neatly relates to this because it, it, she's looking at how the brain's physiology works and red is, you know, 
<laughs> um, it's it's like you're shut down. Yellow, you're on uh, on alert, and green, you're in flow. And so, in terms of emotional intelligence, I think that that it, the, our our ability and our capacity to respond, to listen, these things that were that you just shared, is dependent on on something. I guess the thing is, is that we don't really look at it that much. Um, but it's a, such a huge part of our capacities to this, this emotional wet work, this how we actually operate and the capacities that we have. Um, and so the, the insights that I was able to get through doing the translation, I, I don't know how well I'm able to articulate them, but they really fit in with this deep consideration of our emotional states as they relate to the brain and our capacity to be able to connect um, and so that's that's a great lens and and um, certainly we can put links into that work um, connected to this session so uh, does emotion and intelligence mean that we are able to regulate our emotions uh, able to to sort of not only embrace them, but when they are not in the right moment, the right emotions, that we can sort of modify them? Is that what emotional intelligence means? Well, I think with intelligence, it, it's an operating uh, ability to, in the face of the complexities of, of strong, red-hot emotions, and you know the the fear and the confusion that comes when emotions can overwhelm us. I think it's a, a tool that allows us then to step back and proceed with a, a thoughtful, um, emotionally grounded understanding. So it's all three things of what, as a human being, is called for, and. Um, the reason I mentioned my son was that recently Bill and I, my husband and I have been kind of in a conflict, uh, not with each other, but with another person, a third person. And our boy Nicholas was able to bring his intelligence, uh, his emotional intelligence, as well as his heart to, you know, looking at what are the pieces that are asunder and how do we need to, my husband and I, you know, self-manage ourselves more? And how do we need to be more empathic to the third party that we're struggling with? And when he brought that light to it, it, it allowed the love that we have in our hearts for this third person, but the love that is very compromised by a variety of things, it, it allowed it to, to come forward more and um, permit uh, an opening or an understanding or a commitment um, to begin again, to look at it again, to, to not say, okay, well, this is impossible. We can't do it. We've tried for 10 years. It hasn't worked. And it just kind of opened up possibilities. Um, and, and that was so liberating. And, um, I, I really credit him and I credit myself with all the conversations we had about coming to something, you know, with an emotionally wise, wisdom, with wisdom. You know, calling it emotional intelligence kind of doesn't work as well for me as emotional wisdom because intelligence seems so much a part of the mind. But there is understanding, and that is partly we need our intelligence to do that. But wisdom, in my mind, plays a big part in um, allowing us to then respond in a resilient, let's try again, we can do this, it's important. All those pieces of resilience um, that we talked about in terms of the rubble women and the survivors from the war, you know, who are able to begin again. I think that's what the big gift of emotional intelligence is, that it finds ways to begin again. I know that was a lot. <laughs> so, 
Thank you for that, Dorothy. I love the way you phrased that. Begin again. Uh, and that really resonates for me uh, with the constellation work. That's really what we're doing. Yeah, is we get to we get to see things differently. We get to bring consciousness and awareness to places where there was not consciousness and awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are we born with emotional intelligence or does it develop or can we do something to develop or get better in it and things like that? What do you think? I'm not sure about that. I think some people seem to be automatically more able to deal with emotional situations and some don't seem to be at all. But the question is, is it malleable mal, mal or how do you say changeable? <laughs> uh, is, that, uh, is it something which is there connected with you and that's it? Mm -mm. Yeah. So why not? Tell me more. <laughs> I think we do learn it. Um, I think that whether that's through modeling or through applied attention and will, um, like consciously choosing to develop our, our emotional awareness. I remember um, I was in England in my late 20s and um, I was a part of a, um, uh, a there was a, a restaurant that had a bunch of a bunch of staff and there was a bunch of the different restaurants and they all knew each other and so their conflict just kind of arose in the group somewhat. And I really took, you know, I, I just, I was very much affected by the people and what was arising. And one of the, one of the, my colleagues at the time was like, you need to read this book, Emotional Intelligence, because you you very much have these capacities, but you also need to learn how to take care of yourself in this because I see how invested you are in the relationships and in all of these things. And so it was interesting to me to have her, her give me this resource to be able to be reflective of myself and, uh, and to be able to actually even understand what emotional intelligence was. Now that was in the 90s, late 90s. And uh, and, and I think that in my life, I've had to really have the capacity to know that I'm not perfect and that know that actually I'm perfect in that and that I, <laughs> and that um, uh, really looking at my emotions and how they arise is useful. And so for me, it's kind of about how do we see ourselves and how do we respond appropriately in a situation and for me, that leads actually back to something that I feel Dorothy might have been saying around presence is that you have to, you know, that, that you have to be present in a situation to be able to really read it, to be able to use that intelligence that, that can, you know, can um, evolve into wisdom to understand where we're at. And I think that that's a, that's a collective journey that we're on. Um, but also very personal. Yeah, and when we, are, when we are aroused, let's say, then we are not present, no? So we cannot listen. So for me then the question arises, how do we learn to not be overtaken by these uh, emotions which want to <sighs> grab you? <laughs> Good question, I wanna hear the answer. Yeah, I mean, there are some standard answers, try to do meditation, try to do relaxing techniques and stuff. They, they might help in some occasions, but when it's really, really heavy and you cannot just sit down and or go away, that's, ooh. what do you think? Dorothy, I think you, you know something about that. Well, I think it's called self-calming and I think there's many ways that you can try to do that you know there's there's pausing and there's breathing um sometimes you can just go with the fire and the fury and know that you're not going to stay stuck in it um it seems to me that the, the skills of having emotional intelligence 
questions are rational in many ways and you do learn them or you see them modeled because you have to define um, some of the, the concepts. You have to have a language that looks at them like you have to have an idea of what resilience is and you have to have an idea of um, you know how to commit to um, using these skills. I think our egos in a time of fire and conflict are what is what are you know dominating and um, hijacking us out of these other values these other capacities and um, I think the awareness is as we're all saying you know really can help bring us back um, to where we need to be and um, an interesting thing with the same issue I have is that I, I have a metaphor now, which is part of my uh, emotional intelligence, that I, I see the relationship as a treble clef and as a bass clef. Heidi, you'll relate to this. And I want to stay in the treble. I want to keep the music flowing and I want the notes to move. And when I feel myself moving into a negative, dark place, you know, I call it bass clef, which isn't fair to do to beautiful music that has a bass clef. But for me, it's like a waking up. As soon as I feel what it feels like to start moving into my dark music, my negative, judgmental music, you know, I, I, I bring myself out again. You know, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to be there. So... I don't know how I'd be in the face of the fire, like you're saying, Heidi. I think we just have to forgive ourselves for blowing it and becoming egomaniacs and desperate. But then if we can gather ourselves together again, we start again with a few more possibilities because the more we practice it, the more it becomes ours. So growing up in a home like you're describing, I don't know how a little girl would even recognize that there was such a thing as emotional intelligence because that information wasn't shared with you. And so now you're spending your adult life a, a student of, uh, you know, all of these things saying, you know, it's important and I want to claim it. I want to reclaim it. So I think Nicholas was lucky that I harped away at this big, kid you know to get some of this stuff in him because now he has access to it and look it comes back you know he gives it back to us um that wisdom and i i'm it's just happened and that's why i keep talking about it so much because mm -hmm. i'm just so thrilled you know to have put it in the bank and when i need it most i get to pull it out again mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, that's kind of incredible, Dorothy, because for me, you're really just um, putting a living picture on emotional intelligence and resilience and what that looks like. Because once you've, you know, brought up your child, who's able to then feed you with this knowing not only that how well it worked for him, but also that it does work. Um, I don't know. That's, in, that's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah. I'm wondering if you want to say something, Luna. <laughs> I was, well, I was just thinking Dorothy about what you shared. Um, I just, I, I just jotted down um, what emotional intelligence is, awareness, being able to self-manage, empathy, the ability to listen, uh, and relationship skills. And I was thinking right there, that's a beautiful guide path um, for anyone who's wanting to, um, to find a way to cultivate emotional intelligence. And, and I, going back to the awareness again, I was just thinking about getting curious and how that's been so helpful for me. Um, so when I'm having an emotion that I think, as you were saying, is on the hot scale or feeling really big, um, is to just go, okay, um, hi, emotion. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> 
what do you have to tell me? What are you, why are you here? What's your navigational sort of um, piece in this? And, um, and to ask questions instead of reacting and it allows me to stop. And, and then I'm able to assess when I stop. So not acting out of that place, but getting inquisitive out of that place and, and inquiring inquiring within this i find very interesting and i i can share with you the difficulty i have when i do that i often um, find myself in let's say emotional anger you know when there's something which is then i say to myself oh i shouldn't be angry you know and then uh, is uh, instead of having a healthy way of getting away from the anger it is the the danger to go into the suppression thing you know and i'm sort of all the time in research what what actually do i need to do to to handle this this emotion you know because it's what actually am i doing you know that's that's still from from the time when uh, emotions were not allowed and then i had uh, in my life a time where i just then lifted, you know, fully the emotions uh, because I was happy to to have detected that I have them and that I can express them. So now the the the, the enigma is how to lift them without allowing them to uh, to be dominant, especially the negative ones. And then I come to you, Dorothy. Um, what you are mentioning to, to, to handle, how do you say, self-management, you know, uh, the degrees of self-management is the same thing. I can self-manage myself like German way. You have to do this and to do this and to do that. And, you know, and then I'm self-managed. But is it that the real self-management, you know, the... I don't know if you if you understand what I mean. This this is much more subtle. Uh, what you mean, Dorothy, the the self management out of a different place, um, where we can allow ourselves to to be as we are and still change it, without blaming, without shaming, without yeah, I, I know you you are always like that. You should be different and things like that. You know, and I find that extremely difficult in my life i really have to say and i often find myself resentful against myself so that i don't uh, get it <laughs> as i should do it <laughs> and things like that so oops yeah and uh, when we talked about resilience the other time and somebody said oh you have shown a lot of resilience in the course uh, when Mark died and so on. Yeah, maybe, but maybe not. I see also different levels of, of resilience, you know, and so that's a little bit my, how to say, inner inquiry, what am I dealing with, you know? So I'm still a very big enigma to myself, let's say in this way. <laughs> Heidi, in terms of, uh, you know, what the anger question, that's, that's really an important, that's such an important question. Um, I, I think destigmatizing anger, which culturally is very, very hard to do, um, it isn't a bad emotion, it's just an emotion. And, and anger, healthy anger, any kind of anger is a sign that something is wrong, that something is intruding on you in a way that you just don't have a tolerance for or you don't want or, you know, and it's an intrusive thing that we respond to with anger. And um, I, I think if we can legitimize it and know that it's not bad, that it's just a sign, it's, it's telling us something, kind of like Luna was saying, you know, well, curious, you know, well, you know, what is this about? Uh, that takes us so more into the possibility of understanding and embracing our anger and then proceeding from there. Well, this person is, you know, I don't want to give everything that they're asking, you know, and then you can go back to yourself and we can, you know, 
take charge of our own selves. We can, you know, self calm by saying, well, you don't have to give that much if you don't want to, or, you know, what, what could it really be? And then it, it changes the dialogue um, <clears throat> with these strong emotions. Um, anger was never taboo for me. And so I was always curious, what kind of a relationship do I want to have with my anger? And once I got more curious about it and once I looked at you know well what's why am I responding this way it was always legitimate it was never ever a stupid thing or a bad thing or a you know it was just it's, it's an important piece of information and um, it's very liberating to put anger to put anger and and the more positive emotions on the same line and give them equal respect it's such a a, a, a discounted and and it gets such a bad rap and it's essential for survival emotionally physically everything so um that would be what i would really encourage a, a new relationship with anger where it's just part of the human palette and will understand what its colors are asking for. I think you really just put the nail on the head in terms of, of the reality of it, is that yes, it's all, <laughs> we wanna feel joyful and excited and all those positive things, but it's our relationship with the, with the trouble clef um, and the, the darker emotions that we're like, well, you know, those ones, I don't like those ones. I don't want to have him. <laughs> and fair enough, but they do give such important information. Um, and and it for me, I think that as Heidi was talking, I was thinking about resilience and what that actually means. And, and for me, uh, resilience is the capacity to continuously still come back to the table and to continuously become present and respond in whatever way needs to be responded to. And what I'm, what I'm really learning right now is how to face those more difficult emotions and allow them their place. And so I really appreciate your, your sharing because it, it, that, that is it. Because um, I am working on being more proficient with allowing my anger to just be there and and really allow it to take me on that journey because that's part of the wholeness right um i i, I yeah i i recently went to a, a a workshop by um uh uh philip shepherd who wrote a book called radical wholeness and you know it's not personal it, it, you know, when, and we are a part of the whole system and to really be in a position to be whole, it's inclusive of all of it. And that's yeah. a, it's a big whole space to hold. But I think that's where resilience lives is in the capacity to be angry if that's what's up, if that's what's happening and not, not take it as a, something to whip up and, 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 um, you know, have some sort of explosion, but just what is there? What wants to be seen and heard? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's legitimate. It's a very legitimate human aspect and to outlaw it causes a lot of trouble. It's got to have a seat at the table. You don't want it to bust up the table and be berserk and, and volatile and destructive. But the question is, what does it come to, to, to say? What, is it, what does it need from me? What does my anger need from me? So when I listen and hear this anger, about anger, constant, constantly in my inner eyes come up scenes with people shouting on the street and uh, are angry against whoever or whatever. And... I don't know how, okay. how to handle completely angry and uh, on me or, or whatever, and you are just in the 
in the way and uh, you are sort of an obstacle to their anger. So I probably don't want to do a thing like that or to be treating other people in this way. So um, I don't know. It's, it's just, it was curious that I all the time had this super angry, if it is, oh, uh, yesterday I saw a film, maybe it's for that, uh, the Black Ku Klux Klan. Uh, I, I don't know how, uh, it was a beautiful film. And maybe it comes from that, this um, white supremacists, which they were in their double role of uh, holy, I don't know what, and then the other side really violent, you know, and then uh, the, the, the black um, demonstrations and so on. It's, it's a sort of a mixture of all that, what I was seeing, I think. And also seeing that only be angry against something, it doesn't really make a change. You know, it needs a little bit, a little bit more. So I'm struggling with, with that. The expression of anger, yes, but to what, to what point, you know? Where is the, where is no, the I, limit? Yeah. I don't think we're talking, I'm not talking so much. I'm not looking at how to express it. That's another mm -hmm. really important aspect. Uh, what I'm talking about is that if we have emotional intelligence, if we do live the examined life, uh, we would not choose to abuse people or violate people or injure people with our anger. Our anger is our own and it's our, our red flag to check and see what is being asked for, what is being violated inside me and what do I need to do to make myself, you know, ex better feel, how do I, you know, how do I manage it? And so that I take care of what the problem is and it isn't through violence. It would be through, you know, each time that you take my plate away before I've finished eating, you know, I really feel upset, you know, I, it, where you kind of own what your own feelings are. It's not that you're trying to, you know, abuse anyone, it's try, you're trying to get your own needs met. And if a white racist has the need to hate all black people or all Jews or Muslims, then that isn't a legitimate example of what healthy uh, anger is. Because anger should be constructive. It should, it should teach us what we need to do to make it better for, you know, to make it better to respond to it in an emotionally intelligent, um, wise, spiritual, whatever way. You know, it's, it's a different level we're talking about. And I think it's important to separate out personal responsibility about our anger and, and just bludgeoning it out into the world like, you know, a lunatic. That's, you know, they're very, very different. The other one is like, I don't know what to do about that. I don't know if that helps Heidi to see that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, and at the same uh, moment, I, uh, what I said before, for me, it's not clear where the level is, up to what point I can express my anger, you know? Uh, and where do I need to, to keep it for, for myself? And as education was uh, to keep it for yourself. And so then it's difficult now, as there is no experience, no real lived experience, how far can you go with your anger without um, being a weight on other people, you know? So. And certainly the, the, the um, uh, society aspect, it's a different thing, you know, it's, it's, it's clear. But it, it was only curious because I had these images in my head. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, both Dorothy and Heidi. Um, Dorothy, you mentioned um, anger not being taboo. And my experience was that anger was very taboo growing up. And um, I'd love to hear you speak to that experience of it not being taboo. And, I, and I'm hearing already your emotional intelligence in that being okay um, and your way of being self-referenced uh, and resourced. Um, 
but yeah, that really struck me that you, that you shared that it wasn't taboo. Um, and it, it, it feels like uh, anger is very taboo um, in particular for women. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious about that. I just wanted to put that out to the group. It's a really good question. It's a really good question. You know, I think it's the way that it's expressed. I think it's the way that it's owned. I think it's always dangerous at the hot point of a situation where you feel wounded or very scared or very needy or very tired. That is not a time when it can come out in a way that can be useful or that can be respectful. But I think that once I own my anger and I look at why, what is going on, what is, are these red, red flags about, then I think a, a, a person who is committed to being respectful and clear as they can be has to have the courage usually with another person who has that same experience or commitment but because like Heidi said you always are so worried about the other person's response they get so scared by it or defensive you know it doesn't go anywhere so if it can be shared and it can't be that often with that many people in a way where the other person can listen and tolerate and not feel like they're bad or they're you know, being judged, that someone is just responding to them in a way that informs them that something isn't working. And that to get, and that would require too, Luna, um, personal um, emotional intelligence, because you'd have to have an ability to tolerate it and self manage and listen and postpone your own reactivity so i guess heidi's question and dilemma and in, in your question is based in the reality of how our society really works and there are a few outliers outliers i guess they're called who kind of you know are on the margins saying we can do this differently you know let's learn how to do this differently because i think that the world shows the fact that we aren't and that's why there's so much distress and so much danger. And I think that, you know, some of us can be pioneers and say, look, let's learn to do it. I'm 76 and my 37 year old son had to remind me of some of the basics. So it isn't natural. It's not innate yet in our species, but it, it's, it's, it's very desirable. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and I think, sorry, uh, yeah. sorry, Luna, I, I just wanted to underline, Dorothy, some of what you were saying earlier about um, intelligence, understanding and wisdom, because there's, there's that it's a spectrum. And I think that we do need to use the entry point of our intelligence to be able to, you know, see something. And then it's really understanding what that is, and then taking that into where it's lived in our bones and marrow. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I was following some of your earlier thought forms at that same moment and wanted to share. Go ahead, Luna. Thanks for that, Tammy. Um, I was, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you, Dorothy, if, um, if that was something that was modeled to you uh, by your parents or by uh, a mentor figure as you were growing up. And, um, and also just to really agree with you that um, how important it is that we are pioneers who are modeling a new way of being for one another and doing it in this way and having these conversations and being willing to go into the challenging emotions together and also transparently and publicly uh, and showing a new way of work through conflict together and being okay being uncomfortable with it together yeah that's really true it wasn't modeled luna it wasn't modeled at all 
where the big anger, understanding, and acceptance came from was working year after year as a therapist with wonderful people who had all this anger that they were totally entitled to. And they wouldn't allow their anger, they wouldn't allow their no. And so it gave me this incredible perspective on how useful it would be, how validating it would be for they to be able to understand that they were entitled to be outraged by their childhood and by their molestation and by their poverty and you know all that really um, damage their sense of who they are and co coaching uh, legitimizing you know giving handouts that talked about the legitimacy of anger and how to express anger you know it became a big teaching part of my um, work with people and therefore you know i also began to realize that some of the ways that i express my anger aren't going to get me anywhere but into damage and so it really was um, like <clears throat> tammy said um, it's you know the entryway was just that understanding that that teaching over and over and over anger is the red flag anger is telling you something that is important what's important is the curiosity that you talked about rather than muffling it or feeling so that's how i i did it it just it seemed like a cornerstone of people's stuckness because they couldn't embrace that aspect that legitimate aspect of who they were and so they were trying to get better and recover without one of their tires have, having some air in it <laughs> so no no i my father and i yelled and screamed like lunatics and my mother shuddered in the corner you know he never hit me so i had a lot of um practice getting mad and surviving and still being loved so it wasn't squelched like Heidi's talking about, you know, we, we were screamers, but uh, that isn't where I learned the important parts of it. What happens in your work with anger? Mm -hmm. what the bone, how do the bones direct your work with anger? Um, well, we use people instead of bones. Um, and that's because when the work was given to uh, Bert Hellinger, who, who brought it back to Europe, uh, it was post uh, Second World War and bones were not a, an appropriate uh, way to do the work. And so he started experimenting with, with working with people and he did a lot of that in the prisons. Um, but yeah, anger does arise. And, and one of the big questions that we ask work is, uh, is it primary or is it secondary? And so there's, um, so primary anger uh, is really productive, uh, aware anger that is purposeful and necessary and has momentum and um, uh, a lot of um, space to work with it. And it's very grounded and it feels very different. So when someone's expressing anger in a primary state, uh, it comes from that very responsible place um, and and you were mentioning that like I feel this this is going on this is true for me I need to express this this feeling is is big and and and, and important and uh, and has as you said a seat at the table and it there's a feeling there's a felt sense of that uh, in the room and in, in the person and and we also say uh, Breathing level, breathing level indicates permission. So um, where is the person's breath in their body? And when the anger is in a primary state, it's dropped right down uh, into their center. And, um, and, and that feels very different from secondary. And secondary is uh, the breath is right up here. 
and it feels like the head's going to explode and there's, there's um, sometimes not breathing or holding of breath. Um, and there's a lot of cycling and re-traumatizing and um, the eyes will not be clear. So those are sort of the somatic responses that we see. Uh, and that's, Heidi, you were mentioning people on the street yelling, and that's very often a secondary state when people let anger sort of flare in a way that's um, not appropriate to the situation. Yeah, and um, what I have learned is the primary anger, uh, put it into a secondary sadness substitute it you know so that's uh, the propensity to to depression and things like that that's for to not allow the anger that's which you say is a constructive anger mm -hmm. and if you cannot use that then you go into something else in the secondary uh, or, or secondary anger <laughs> and uh, smash the tables or something i tried it once but it didn't work <laughs> It was funny, <laughs> awkward and ridiculous <laughs> to, to smash a plate, you know, on the floor. And I, I laughed at myself. That really didn't work. <laughs> uh, but I have learned to, to put it into sadness. And um, yeah. So also there, it is the same um, enigma. When is the sadness real sadness? Or when it is the substitution for something else? You know, that's... Uh, Inquiry, constant inquiry. Yeah. I, I love that distinction, Luna, between primary and secondary anger. And I think that the stigma that uh, Dorothy was talking about is really relevant there because we kind of push it away so we don't even look closely enough to see, is that my anger? Or is that, am I angry about something on behalf of someone else? Um, and, and certainly the more systemic or um, uh, global connected anger is, is something that's a huge own topic on itself. Um, and I'm really uh, going to take that into my, into my days to deeply consider and be curious about, as I'm experiencing anger, is it mine or is it someone else's? So thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. It was good. Heidi, I always have thought about uh, sadness as it can also come first. I think a lot of men, but probably women too, I see it mainly in men, they'll feel uh, all of a sudden, you know, something will trigger uh, feelings of sadness or, or feelings of of being out of control, that they, you know, they really can't manage what's happening, and they'll go into rage. That's what, the, you know, so much of the domestic violence situation is about, is covering that vulnerability. And the way you talked about it, it seems like it can go either way, that, you know, when you're vulnerable, you go um, <clears throat> toward anger to cover it up. But I've never thought about going from anger uh, to sadness, but I guess a repressed anger would be would make you very sad because, in a way, we're letting ourselves down. There's if it is a red flag of something that needs attention to, and we say no, 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 I won't go there. It's too hard, or I don't know how, or this person isn't safe to do it with. Then really, we internalize it, and we're just so sad because we're. We're not doing what we need to do. We're saying a huge no to ourselves. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And that's the propens propensity for men uh, ex uh, changing uh, sadness with anger and the other way around for women. I think uh, that uh, seems to be the no normal way yeah. of doing <laughs> It really is. It really is. Some women in session who are outraged, who have so much legitimate anger, all they do is cry through the whole session. You know, it's such an interesting um, symbol 
and we, you know, we look at that too of, you know, well, how come those tears just come and, and cover it right away? You know, it's too dangerous to go to. And so, but the tears are legitimate for women. And so that takes a long time to uh, break through or, you know, have the, the confidence to try to, you know, let a little of that anger out. It's really, it's really astonishing to watch someone who hasn't permitted anger allow some of it, how absolutely terrifying it is for them to see it. They're, you know, they're not worried about anyone else seeing it. So, yeah, anger really has a, ter a bad rap in our society. Yeah, we are almost at the top of the hour. And so I would like to uh, do a check out and see a little bit if what we understood may be a little better today. I can jump in. I really loved um, this as an experience of of collective resilience to lean into Dorothy's experience and Luna's and yours, Heidi, and to and to be able to look at it from different perspectives. I think that that is an element of resilience that I want to underline um, that we've been demonstrating in this session today um, to really be able to listen and hear to understand and to pull out the parts that are still a question and where to be curious and all of those things I think demonstrate the resilience that we need to grow as humans so I'm deeply appreciative to be in such a fantastic circle of humans um, here and uh, yeah, so much gratitude to all of your knowledge, wisdom, and lived experience. It's really informed this conversation for me and my life. So I'll take that away. Oh, Tammy, that was so beautifully put. I agree. I think each one of us brought uh, such a unique sense of our own perspective and uh, our own personally uh, defined resilience and put it into a larger context of all of us together uh, looking at the aspects of something this important and this um, varied. I think Heidi's questions triggered so many, um, oh, interesting uh, ripples. I really appreciate it. And Luna, I'm really happy that you're here today. I really appreciate your quiet, clear, uh, gentle expression and sharing of something really quite new to me. And Tammy, you're always very articulate and warm. And yeah, it was a lovely group for me today. It was a, a big, big hour. Thank you both. Thank you all. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, Heidi, for creating space for us to talk about uh, these important things. I, I'm so grateful. Um, and uh, do I have any final thoughts? I, what I want to underline is that I truly believe that anyone can cultivate emotional intelligence and resilience. And I, I feel that some, you started out asking this question, Heidi, and I I feel like, yes, some people come in knowing and some people are tempered by their environment. Um, and, but I also, I truly believe that we can learn this um, and that, um, yeah, we can make that choice. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, and thank you too. And especially as Tammy, you said that we are able to talk about these things and also publicly. So, so many people probably have similar questions and similar, um, let's say, insecurities or, or, you know, and inquiries. And alone is really difficult to, to go ahead. And if they don't have anybody to talk about, at least maybe they come across what we are doing and they can get inspired and that's the main thing why i do these things you know publicly and we are sharing not some hypothetical thing but really things of our lives and i think that might um give the let's say the power to people to to go into their own 
lives more intensively and know that in some way we can make it, as you said, we can also learn it, you know, and so, and we are never at, at the end of learning. We are always, you know, it's this process of continuous going ahead. Some steps we have already mastered, some others are still to master, and that's life. And thank you for your collaboration, because I always think I myself couldn't think about all these things. I, I need you and the associations that which come in and uh, and that's what I understand under co-creative dialogue and that's wonderful. Thank you and see you next Thank you. month. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bravo. Thank you.